What are some Google searches that have led to people's arrests? Today, we're gonna to talk about the dentist who was just arrested for putting poison in his wife's protein shakes. And I cover all sorts of spooky and true crime stuff on this page, so follow along for more. On March 6th, Angela Craig went to the hospital for dizziness and severe headaches. She would eventually pass away as her symptoms got worse. But what we know now is that her husband, James Craig, was slipping both arsenic and cyanide into her protein shakes. And part of the reason we know this is because of what James was looking up on his work computer weeks before his wife's death. Searches like how to make poison, undetectable poisons, and five undetectable poisons that show no sign of foul play, as if there was a fun listicle about it. And the shocking part of all of this is this is allegedly not the first time that James had tried to poison his wife. He allegedly poisoned her five or six years ago and she found out. And it's now believed that he was doing all this so that he could run away with another woman. Morbid animal facts, part one. In India, a species called the sloth bear is far more feared than tigers because of their violent and unpredictable nature. This deer suffers from CWD, more commonly known as zombie disease. It damages the beast's brain, causing it to become confused and slowly waste away. The mantis shrimp, which is only about 3 inches long, can punch with the force of a 22 caliber bullet. The punch is so fast, in fact, that it boils the water around it and can even shatter glass. A moose is capable of diving up to 20 feet underwater in search of food and can swim three times as fast as humans. This photo shows the captive orca Tilicum looking at its trainers. Now there have only been four deaths in human history caused by orcas, and Tilicum is responsible for three of them. Like and follow for part two. This is the most terrifying McDonald's you'll ever see. In 1986, the first floating McDonald's called the McBarge opened up. McPlan was to bring McDonald's to everyone around the world. The five employees that worked on the boat full time started to hear voices. And it wasn't just regular voices. It was clown voices. And these voices just kept haunting them, telling them to end their lives and that their lives had no meaning. And that the clown was coming for them. The clown was coming for them. The clown was coming for them. This phrase was repeated to them over and over and over again until it drove them to insanity. Slowly, the McDonald's workers started going insane and hallucinating. And after months of this, one fry cook decided enough was enough. And the next night, Megan took her life to get off the boat. After the incident, McDonald's had to close the McBarge. This is until 20 years later when a company found out the McBarge was still floating. Hearing about the ship's condition, one YouTuber decided to go inside of it. If you want to find out what happened to the YouTuber, make sure to like and follow for part 2. This is the most terrifying McDonald's you'll ever see! In 1986, the first floating McDonald's called the McBarge opened up. McPlan was to bring McDonald's to everyone around the world. The five employees that worked on the boat full time started to hear voices. And it wasn't just regular voices. It was clown voices. And these voices just kept haunting them, telling them to end their lives and that their lives had no meaning. And that the clown was coming for them. The clown was coming for them. The clown was coming for them. This phrase was repeated to them over and over and over again until it drove them to insanity. Slowly, the McDonald's workers started going insane and hallucinating. And after months of this, one fry cook decided enough was enough. And the next night, Megan took her life to get off the boat. After the incident, McDonald's had to close the McBarge. This is until 20 years later when a company found out the McBarge was still floating. Hearing about the ship's condition, one YouTuber decided to go inside of it. If you want to find out what happened to the YouTuber, make sure to like and follow for part two. I'm looking photos that have a disturbing backstory. Part 27. This photo shows an elderly couple doing the hokey pokey with a man named Dennis Rader, also known as the BTK killer. He installed alarms for a living, and ironically, many clients booked his services to prevent him from entering their homes. This photo shows Luchadora Wanavaraza. She was sold to a man for three beers by her mother until her stepdad found her at age 17. Over the years that followed, she would strangle and rob over 45 old women that reminded her of her abusive mom. The man in the background is Christopher Wilde, aka the Beauty Queen Killer. This picture was taken on June 15th, 1984, and Chris is scouting future victims at a beauty pageant. This photo shows John Edward Robinson holding a baby girl named Tiffany. Just one day before this photo was taken, he murdered the baby's mother and gave Tiffany to his brother, saying that she was adopted. His brother, along with Tiffany, didn't find out the truth for 15 years. Sometimes I hear a story so scary it makes me check every room in my apartment. So years ago, this older woman was living alone in her home in Denver. She had recently broken her hip, and before she went to the hospital, her house felt fine. But when she came back, something felt off. 
Like it would sound like her caretaker was in the other room, but when she would go in, no one would be there. There were also way more like bumps in the night and sometimes those bumps sounded like footsteps. Eventually this woman starts thinking that her house is haunted, but one night her caretaker is getting ready to leave for the day and she hears the noises. And she's like, I have to check this out. I have to get to the bottom of what this is. So she goes to the back stairs where she hears the sound coming from and there she sees this skeletal man with sunken in eyes just staring back at her. And she loses it. She runs away screaming. She calls the police and the police come and search the house but they can't find anyone until they check the attic and they see that there's this crawl space which is about the size of a coffin that an adult man had been living in. Yeah, and he had been there for nine months. And crazier yet, the man ends up confessing to a murder. The whole story is super wild. Make sure you check it out on the podcast this week. Huge trigger warning for this case as it is very upsetting. 37-year-old Nancy Johnson from Alabama and her children were found deceased on the 28th of September. The mother of two drowned her children in the bath before taking her own life. Her children were two-year-old Jacob and five-year-old Maya. She also allegedly cut her daughter's throat. She then is believed to have unalived herself with a silk belt in a hallway wardrobe. The children's autopsies showed that they died from drowning, but Maya's blood loss contributed to her death. Heartbreakingly, the children's dad, Derek, was actually the one that found them. He found the bodies of the children on a sofa underneath a blanket. Nancy and Derek were in the middle of divorce proceedings and a custody battle. Nancy also had a history of mental illness. The parents had been ordered by a judge to start seeing the children on alternate weeks. The arrangement was due to start in just a matter of days. The dad wrote, The amount of happiness and love that emanated from Mia and Jacob was very apparent to all that they were around. Our house was filled with joy and happiness. Their future was so bright in every way possible. I would have peed myself if I saw this. So Sale was a paper delivery boy years ago, and what he saw on his route is terrifying. Before we dive in, if you love ghost stories, make sure you check out my podcast. This week's episode is all ghost stories from listeners. So when Sale was a paper delivery boy, he always delivered to this one house in his neighborhood where an old woman lived. She was not in great health, so she actually had given him a key so he could let himself in and leave the paper on the table. One day he lets himself in in the middle of the day and he sees that she's in her room lying in her bed fully asleep. This is not normal for her. So he calls to her, but she doesn't answer. So he puts the paper on the table and he just heads out. But the next day is the same exact thing. He comes into her house and she's asleep in her room, not moving and not answering. So he's like, okay, if I come back tomorrow and it's the same thing, I'm going to call for help. Except the next day when he arrives, she greets him at the door and she's saying things like, thank you so much for delivering my paper. I loved seeing you around. I'm gonna miss you. And he's like, okay, that's kind of weird. So the next day he comes back to deliver the paper and there's cars all outside. So Sale runs up to a police officer and is like, what's going on? And the police calmly explains that the woman in the house had passed away days prior and a neighbor finally noticed and called it in. So then who did Sale see when he went to the house? I'm not even cool. I'm just one of those girls that can do a lot of drugs and not die. This is Mackenzie Shirilla, a TikToker who killed her boyfriend and his friend in 2022. So as you saw in that TikTok video, Mackenzie was bragging about her drug use. So in July of 2022, Mackenzie was in her car with her boyfriend and his friend, Dominic and Davian, and they were all just having a fun night smoking pot. That is, until Mackenzie, who was driving, decided to suddenly accelerate to 100 miles per hour in the vehicle. And she slammed the car into the brick wall of a warehouse going 100 miles an hour with no attempt made to hit the brakes. It's unknown exactly how Mackenzie survived this insane car crash, but like I said before, both other passengers, her boyfriend and his friend, died at the scene. Recently though, Mackenzie was sentenced to 15 years to life in prison for these deaths. That's because the prosecutors argued that Mackenzie actually set out to murder her boyfriend after their fling fizzled out. And she decided that the best way to do this would be a car crash. And her boyfriend's friend Dominic just ended up being cargo. I think once again, this is just an example of how someone can seem so normal on the internet, but you have no idea who they are or what they're capable of. But thankfully, she faced massive repercussions for her actions here, and she's going to be in prison for a long time and have a lot of time to think about the terrible decisions she made. These are the top three most heart-wrenching true crime documentaries. Number three for me is Goodnight Sugar Babe. For me, this documentary is just so heartbreaking due to the amount of horrific themes involved and also just the vulnerability of the victim. 
It includes themes of CSA and the brutal murder and torture of a woman who is a young mum and also has learning disabilities. Number two is the trials of Gabrielle Fernandez. Anything with kids involved I personally just find so so heartbreaking. This documentary series looks at the brutal murder of an eight-year-old boy. What makes it even worse is the horrific abuse that he suffered from his mum and his mum's boyfriend. He was also just let down in so many ways by the systems that are meant to keep him safe. And then number one for me is Dear Zachary. This documentary has a huge amount of interviews with people who knew the victim, um, family members, friends, and also a lot of home video footage. It's just such a real personal insight into this family, which I feel makes it even more heart-wrenching. I obviously won't spoil what happens in the documentary, but if this one doesn't make you cry, I don't know what will. This woman murdered her husband for YouTube fame. Samantha was 20 years old when she met Ernie Ibarra at a tattoo shop and they quickly hit it off and started dating. Samantha had twins from a previous high school relationship that didn't work out and Ernie became the father figure of these kids and worked hard to support the family. Three years later, Samantha and Ernie had another set of twins and then two years after that, they had a fifth child. Ernie worked multiple jobs to make ends meet and in the meantime, Samantha created YouTube videos where she mainly complained about her kids and her husband. She had really high hopes for her YouTube career and started putting so much time into it and began neglecting her kids and this caused a lot of fights between her and Ernie. On February 20th, 2015, police were called to Ernie and Samantha's home and she claimed that three men broke in and kidnapped Ernie. During her interviews, police noticed a lot of inconsistencies in her stories and she admitted that she knew the intruders but she had nothing to do with it. Police eventually found text messages between her and the three men and she was actually the mastermind behind all of this. On the night of the kidnapping, Samantha left the front door open for the three men to enter and when they came in, they kidnapped Ernie, took him to the woods and shot him in the head. Investigators believe that Samantha's motive was to gain sympathy and attention from her audience on YouTube after Ernie's murder. Samantha and Octavius were sentenced to life in prison while Jose and Jonathan pleaded guilty and were only given 50 years each. 115 dead bodies were just found rotting inside of this funeral home in Colorado yesterday. This is an extremely disturbing news story. So this is the Return to Nature funeral home in Colorado Springs, Colorado. They specialize in green burials, which is kind of a new trendy thing, which amongst other things means that your body is not embalmed upon your death. So you're kind of left to rot and just go back into nature as you came into the world. But it seems like the owners of this funeral home took that process a step too far. So inside of this funeral home where there's 2,500 square feet of space, they discovered 115 bodies. I mean, I can't imagine what the interior of that building looked and smelled like. And according to the police department that made this shocking discovery, most of those bodies were so badly decomposed that they can only identify them through DNA. Obviously, this means that these bodies have been stored there improperly for a very, very long time. In another interesting twist, the authorities actually stated that they don't know exactly what this funeral home was doing with these bodies. Some theories include they may have been selling body parts. Obviously, they may have just been telling people they were burying their loved ones and they weren't. Or there could be other gruesome, disturbing things that were happening here that I guess we'll find out about soon. Yeah, so since this happened yesterday, we don't know much about what exactly was going on here, but I'll be sure to update you guys once we find out more about what the hell was going on at this funeral home. Kidnapped at 11. Gave birth in captivity by 14. My name is J.C. Lee Dugard, and this is my haunting tale. Held for 18 years in a backyard prison in California. Only the bravest should stay. My name is J.C. Lee Dugard. In 1991, when I was just 11 years old and walking to my school bus stop, everything changed. Kidnapped in broad daylight by Philip and Nancy Garrido, I was imprisoned in their back garden, hidden from the world in a maze of squalid tents and dilapidated shacks. Every day, I was subjected to unimaginable violence, both physical and mental. The isolation was total, the despair omnipresent, but the worst was yet to come. At the age of 14, I gave birth to a daughter, the fruit of Philip's relentless abuse. A few years later, a second daughter was born under the same atrocious conditions. These girls, despite the circumstances of their birth, 
became my beacon of hope, my ray of sunshine in this hellish world. Years went by, each day seeming like an eternity. But in 2009, fate struck. Following an unexpected interaction with the police, my identity was discovered, putting an end to 18 years of captivity. Today, I'm free. I've been reunited with my family and I'm fighting to rebuild my life. My story, though different, is reminiscent of Josef Fritzl's in Austria, two stories of survival and resilience in the face of adversity. I share my experiences to educate, inspire, and show that the human spirit can overcome the worst. For more heartbreaking stories, subscribe and leave comments. If this isn't a terrifying reminder to always lock your doors, then I don't know what is. Quick trigger warning, the details in this case are pretty brutal. In 2021, 26-year-old Luke Dealey had been hearing voices. He was obsessed with the devil and claimed that a higher power was telling him he needed to kill someone. He'd recently been admitted to a psychiatric hospital and had stopped taking his medication. He'd also then enrolled at university, but soon left after his housemates found his behaviour weird. On November 21st, 2021, Luke decided to listen to those voices and find someone to kill. He roamed the streets looking for a house that was unlocked. That's when he came across the house of 65-year-old June Fox Roberts. That day, June had dropped her two daughters off at the train station and they promised to ring her the next morning to check in. That night, she went to bed as normal, but in the early hours of the next morning, something disturbed her and she went downstairs to check out the noise. She encountered Luke at the bottom of her stairs. Luke launched a frenzied and violent attack on June and he hit her so hard in the middle of her forehead that she lost consciousness and fell to the ground. He then trampled all over her body before dragging her lifeless body into another room. But just killing June wasn't enough for Luke. He then used an axe to chop off her head, arms and legs. He then stuffed her body parts into black bin bags and left her right there in her dining room. Luke then attempted to clean up the mess in the hallway before shaving his beard off and dyeing his hair. He then fleed the scene. When June's daughters couldn't get in touch with her the next day, they became concerned and decided to go to her house. They found her door unlocked and her dismembered body in the dining room. An appeal was put out to the public to find Luke after he'd been seen on CCTV in the area. And after two days, he was found and arrested after sleeping rough in a trailer park. Police discovered that Luke had been admitted to a psychiatric hospital that year and he'd been diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. They also visited his previous university accommodation and found some artwork that Luke had done that was of a demonic nature. Luke's trial began and June's family said that she was the absolute light of their life. She was a mother, a grandmother and a great grandmother and she loved nothing more than spending time with her extended family. They said that her death has absolutely shattered their lives. Luke pleaded guilty to manslaughter on the grounds of diminished responsibility due to his mental health problems. And on April 28th, 2023, he was sentenced to a hospital order, which is indefinite, meaning he can stay in a mental health facility instead of being sent to prison. This is probably every parent's worst nightmare. It all started on June 2013 when eight-year-old Cherish and her mother Rain and two younger sisters went to Dollar General in Jacksonville and met a man named Donald Smith. You see, Rain struggled financially and when she couldn't afford to buy Cherish a dress that she really wanted, Donald overheard this and then offered to take her and her daughters to Walmart on a shopping spree. Donald then offered to give Rain and her daughters a ride to Walmart and she accepted. But when they arrived to Walmart, Walmart, Donald was making very inappropriate comments to Cherish. And as the store was closing, he offered to go to the McDonald's in the Walmart and buy everyone some food. And he asked that Cherish come with him. Surveillance footage shows them leaving Walmart and clearly Cherish looks comfortable around this person and she doesn't think he's a threat. Rain said that the store started to close and there was still no sign of Cherish and Donald. So she spent about 20 minutes looking for them until she called the police. They issued an Amber Alert and finally at 9.05 
5 a.m., they spotted Donald driving his white van and they stopped him, but Cherish was not in the car. When Donald was brought into custody, he was wearing the same clothes and he was all wet, but he told police that he was doing drugs all night and that causes him to sweat. But sadly, that same morning, Cherish's body was found at the bottom of a creek behind a church. She suffered very horrific injuries and this is a trigger warning. Cherish suffered blunt force trauma to the head. She was strangled, arred, and she suffered a lot of injuries in her genital area. It turns out that Donald was a registered sex offender and he was released from prison only three weeks prior and he was charged and sentenced to death. Now, what's disturbing is a conversation he had with his mother in prison that was recorded and he basically told her that Cherish followed him outside of the Walmart so he had no option but to get rid of her. A murdered toddler and a killer who now calls herself a celebrity and a prison pinup. Star Hobson was just 16 months old when she was failed by social services during lockdown. Bruises were missed, as was a skull fracture and a fractured ankle. This one is particularly hard for me to cover as I have a son who's a few weeks older than Star. She'd have been turning four next month. Star was born on May 21st, 2019 to parents Frankie Smith and Jordan Hobson. Frankie was just 17 years old when she gave birth to Star. Star's parents split up not long after she was born and Frankie, her mother, began a relationship with club bouncer Savannah Brockhill. At the beginning of 2020, after a call from one of Frankie's friends, social services visited twice but closed the case shortly after. During this time, Frankie had got her own place and the UK had gone into lockdown due to the COVID-19 pandemic. In March 2020, Savannah had become quite violent towards Frankie and she'd also told a friend that she thought about driving them both off a cliff. During May and June 2020, calls were made to social services by Star's grandma and her father, saying that they were concerned for her safety, as Savannah had been using wrestling moves on 11-month-old Star to restrain her while Frankie did nothing. Social services visited and the case was again closed. The case was reopened in July. Just a quick trigger warning here, there is a picture coming up of Star's bruising. Star's grandfather had called social services after seeing bruising on her face and this was checked out and was explained by Savannah and Frankie as being caused by a fall and the case was closed again. That same month, Savannah had been seen on CCTV assaulting Star in town and dragging her through town by her reins while she struggled to walk. It was later found that the reason Star was struggling to walk was because she had a fractured ankle. On the 22nd of September 2020, Star's life was taken away at just 16 months old. She was playing at home when Savannah viciously attacked her and either kicked or punched her in the stomach, causing her organs to rupture as well as an artery, which caused internal bleeding. The force of that blow was likened to that of a car crash victim. The couple didn't call an ambulance straight away, instead they used Google to search for how to treat shock in babies. Star passed away that day and a post-mortem showed old injuries including a fractured skull and a fractured ankle. Frankie was sentenced to 12 years for allowing the death of her daughter and Savannah was given a life sentence with a minimum of 25 years. Sickeningly, she's got an actual fan club that write to her, send her fan mail, gifts and money and she thinks of herself as a bit of a celebrity. On 29, 2003, a 14 year old boy named John was rushed to the hospital with stab wounds to the chest and stomach. When officers examined the CCTV footage, they saw a 16 year old boy named Mark enter the alleyway shortly before John was attacked. They discovered that Mark, for the past six months, had been spending almost 12 hours a day on an internet chat room, talking to a variety of people, including a British secret agent, who gave him a mission to kill John. And if Mark was successful, he would be able to meet the prime minister and be given 500,000 pounds. The only problem was that all the people Mark was talking to were characters created by John, who became the first person in UK history to be convicted of inciting his own murder. What? What's the 
there, mate? Just look in there. What? Look in there. One of the most successful serial killers in history is never talked about. Let's talk about Julia Tafana, who was said to have killed around 600 men. That is a lot of men. There is little known about Julia's life and upbringing. No pictures, nothing. This story takes place in the Renaissance period in Italy. Back then, women didn't really have any rights. Like, at all. They were usually forced into arranged, loveless marriages. In this time, when you got married, your husband owned you. Men had full ownership and control over their wives. Husbands would often beat their wives without any consequence. And unfortunately for the women, divorce was basically non-existent at the time. It wasn't even an option. So safe to say there was a lot of women stuck in abusive and loveless marriages with no way out. That's until Julia started her little business. Julia created an odorless, tasteless, and colorless, undetectable poison, and she put it in makeup products. She disguised her poison in beauty products that women could easily keep on their vanity, and no one would question it. She called it Aqua Tefana. Pretty cool name. This product would allow women to discreetly kill their husbands over the span of four days. A few drops every day, and the initial symptoms would simply seem like a flu. A few more drops the next few days and it would slowly weaken and eventually kill the men. You're probably wondering how she got away with killing all of these men without anybody noticing. Well, Julia was very careful. She didn't just sell Aqua Tefana to anyone. Any new client had to be verified by a past client and have a background check. Julia's clients were actually really protective over her as well and kept her secret. This went on for over 20 years. Julia would also coach the women on how to act around the days of the poison. After the first day, when the husband starts getting the flu symptoms, to act really concerned and call a doctor. The doctor would come and assume it was just a basic illness, give them medication, and leave. The key was that the women were the ones to call the doctor. They had to act concerned, anxious. When the husbands would eventually die, the doctors would be baffled. And the key to all this was that the women were told to demand an autopsy. But the thing about Aqua Tefana is that it was undetectable in an autopsy, meaning that all of these deaths came back as natural causes. Unfortunately, the story is too long for one video, so come back for part two to see what happens next. This is a woman people are calling the real life Gone Girl. She faked her own horrific abduction and wasted five years of police time. You're not gonna wanna miss this one. It is absolutely insane. This all begins November 2nd of 2016. Keith Papini returned home from work at around 5 p.m. He was expecting to come home to his 34-year-old wife, Sherry Papini, and his two kids, but they weren't home. Keith called the daycare where his kids were staying and asked when Sherry came to pick up the kids. The daycare then told him that she never came, so the kids were okay. He immediately finds this very strange, calls the police, and reports her missing. This was taken very seriously by the police. She seemed to have vanished out of thin air. It wasn't long before the news was reporting on it and her missing posters were all over California. Because there were no leads, fingers pointed at Keith, the husband. Everyone thought it was Keith. He even took a polygraph test and passed it, but people still thought it was him. That's until 22 days later, when Sherry returned. 150 miles away from where she was last seen, a driver finds her walking on the side of the road in chains. This driver called the police and she was brought in. She was covered in bruises. She had lost weight and her back had been branded. Understandably, police were shocked. When asked what happened, she claimed that two Hispanic women abducted her. She claimed that they were going to sell her to a man and that's why she was branded. Police were taking this very seriously. Sherry explained in detail the abuse that she went through and the room she was in. She also described the women enough for them to create a sketch of people who did not exist because it was all a lie. Police found it very strange that these abductors just let her go, but this isn't to say that they didn't believe her. They definitely did and they took it very seriously. 
They were determined to find out who did this to this poor mother of two. The government helped pay for therapy for her PTSD and anxiety after this event. During this time, police were testing her clothes and they finally found DNA. This DNA belonged to a man, not a woman. And she apparently encountered no men during this kidnapping. They put it through the police database and nothing came up. That's until 2020 when they decided to put it through a genealogy database, hoping that someone related to the person with this DNA went on like Ancestry or anything like that. With this, they were able to find the exact person with that DNA. And this person was Sherry's ex-boyfriend. The story only gets crazier from here, so come back for part two. It'll be up the moment I'm done filming.